Welcome to the Beyond the Scope podcast presented by MDMD Productions and made possible by Augusta Podcast, your one-stop shop for launching your podcast. Let Augusta Podcast do all the heavy lifting and give you the tools you need to turn your podcast dreams into a reality. Learn more at AugustaPodcast.com slash NDMD. I'm your host, Andy, second year medical student, and if you are familiar with the NDMD YouTube channel, you'll know that we love sharing stories from students, residents, and attendings of all different kinds of medical professions while giving you an inside look into their lives, not just as healthcare workers, but the incredible people they are as well. This podcast continues the mission of sharing the incredible stories and experiences of those amazing people, but this time it's all about the things all those years of medical training doesn't prepare you for. Things that are beyond the scope of our practice, if you will. So whether it's navigating starting a family as a medical student or physician, or learning how to not make financial mistakes throughout your medical training, the goal is to bring on incredible role models who can guide you through those puzzling questions. So with that being said, let's introduce today's guests. And today we have a rural family medicine resident at East Carolina University who is also a budding YouTuber. Uh, funny enough, even though I've done like a ton of these interviews with all different kinds of physician specialties, this is actually my first time uh, with a family medicine doctor. Not really sure why, but I'm excited nonetheless. So here to talk about the unique aspects of rural medicine and to a greater extent, family medicine. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Zeal Shaw. Hi, guys! <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a lot of enthusiasm for 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I need that energy. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know you told me to call you Zeal, and um, being raised in the South, that still feels wrong. I'm still getting... <laughs> I'm still getting used to calling physicians by their first names. I'm just like, I can't, I, I can't do it. This, this feels so strange. I, I have to call you Dr. Shaw. So if I slip up uh, throughout this, uh, that's, that's <laughs> I'll my, try not uh, to be offended. <laughs> that is my humble beginnings speaking uh, out for you. But uh, let's get started. So kind of introduce yourself, specialty, where you went to undergrad and med school, uh, and then say favorite food. Okay. All right. So hi, I'm Dr. Zeal Shaw, or you call me Zeal. Um, and I'm originally Canadian. I'm from um, the suburbs of Toronto, Canada. Um, and I went to you know, uh, undergrad in Canada. And then I went to medical school on uh, St. Martin. So the school, I went to a small um, Caribbean medical school uh, called Uni American University of Integrative Sciences. It's now moved to Barbados. And then that's where I like developed my love for rural medicine and small communities. And yeah, and I got to do my uh, rotations all over the United States. And my favorite food is um, pizza, obviously. Like I am an aficionado, like I'm a connoisseur of pizza, like it's very serious. It's very serious because I lived in New York City for a really long time. So I know good pizza. So all you people from Chicago, y'all need to stop calling that whatever that deep dish stuff is like, because that's a very liberal use of the word pizza. Just saying. <laughs> okay. Bench over. Bench <laughs> <laughs> over. Uh, no, one of the questions I always ask, like in my 72 question interviews is most controversial question, pineapple and pizza. Yes or no? Absolutely not. <laughs> What? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the and, Italians uh, are like rolling in their grave right now. What is happening? <laughs> I let uh, the viewers pass judgment on both If sides you like pineapple on pizza, and my husband does, but you guys are all wrong. So, sorry, controversial <laughs> opinion. Wow, okay. You can't be calling out people listening or watching that <laughs> watching. Wow, it is early in the morning. Uh, but we still right. love you. It's fine. We accept you. It's unconditional. All right. Maybe the coffee will hit as we go along. <laughs> um, but so I know we talked before, uh, but one of the interesting things that kind of like wanted me to get you on this interview is kind of uh, how unique your specific residency program is. Mm -hmm. um, and it's pretty special and like my class uh you're the guinea pig class aka the 
first ones to go through it. So can you explain the structure of your residency program? Yeah, for sure. So it's really cool, actually. So uh, so my program is the Rural Family Medicine Program at East Carolina University. We're associated with Brody School of Medicine. They have uh, the traditional track, and it's been there for like a billion years, but not really, but like maybe like 40, 50 years. It's a very well-established um, family medicine program. And originally, the purpose of the program was to serve Eastern North Carolina, which has historically been a very rural, underserved population. So as Green grew the original we got a little far away from the original mission which was to serve the rural communities so they're trying to get back to that mission by the creation of the rural track so this track is was i'm the first class for this track and it's really cool because um what we do is that we spend the first year um, in Greenville with the rest of the traditional track. And then the second two years, we go off into a rural site. So mine is a husky, and that's about like 4,500 to 5,000 5, people. And we it's really cool. And I think it's awesome because um, we actually get to do a lot more stuff that the traditional track doesn't really get to do in terms of being very procedure heavy, in terms of being... Um, more independent and autonomous and getting a very diverse range of experience. So that's how the typical structure is. The first year we spend in Greenville with the traditional track. So we're all at the same baseline and we're providing the same standard of care to our rural counterparts outside of Greenville. So that's the entire mission. So what's been the most, I know you're still in your intern year. Yeah. Um, but what's been the most fun part? or like the most memorable part of your experience so far? Honestly, all of it. Like it's been so much fun. I think, okay, so hands down the best part about my program, and I'm literally not just saying this, it's my program director and my coordinator and my site director. So Dr. Whitman, Audie Whitman, program director, shout out. Uh, Dr. Uh, Janine Jones, she's now the chief medical officer at our community, like the RCCHC, which is a federally qualified health center. And, um, and then our coordinator, Jessica Brinkley. So it was because of them that I was actually drawn to the program in the first place. And they're hands down the best part of it. There's so much fun. Like I go to my rural site, uh, like once a week for an ambulatory clinic and it's so cute because we have our own little office and like for Christmas and stuff they had like presents set up and then our coordinator she sets up like like she surprises with like these cute little inspirational messages and I think that's literally the most fun part is just that when I go into clinic like I'm like you know I'm coming home kind of like to a bunch of like really awesome supportive people so I think that's easily the most fun part. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a family, you know, like yeah. family medicine. <laughs> no, that, yeah. that didn't land. Okay. But I'm uh, <laughs> coffee's going to kick in, I'm telling you. Um, but just a curiosity in case any medical students are listening <laughs> to this and going, like, that's something that I want to shoot for or maybe a program I would be interested in. Are there any different or special considerations um, when you're applying to match to this program? that would like propel you to the rural medicine track over the traditional track so like, is it like the same way that you applied to the program in terms of um could you explain it again <laughs> so like when you're if you're wanting to match into this program yeah is there anything different you have to do to oh, go okay. into the rural medicine track versus the traditional Okay, thanks for clarifying. Okay, so um, that's a great question. I would say that pretty much, uh, not really. I think that the things that you typically would do for uh, the traditional track, you would do for the rural track. The biggest difference is you, quite frankly. It's your personality. So if you feel that you're the type of person that can integrate themselves into a community that likes having um, that close-knit bond and likes being the one that people look to for um, a lot of answers because, you know, they don't have the same degree of resources in a rural area as they do in more ur urban areas, then this is a place for you because people, once they trust you, they really do trust you. So I think that's like the biggest thing. Um, 
I think that if you're from a small town, that's a huge asset um, or you've been in a, a, like a smaller community because it shows us that you truly do understand the needs of a rural area and you can adequately you know, provide and be a good physician in these areas because that's what we need. We need people that you know, can build the report that's necessary and have a deeper understanding of what it means to be a rural physician. And it is quite different than being um, a resident in different, like more populated parts of North Carolina or any other place. Okay. Uh, I think it's incredibly well said. Now, mm -hmm. uh, kind of going back to what kind of personality it takes to get here, what made you personally fall in love with rural medicine? Okay. So, okay. So what made me fall in love with rural medicine is like the fact that I went to um, a Caribbean medical school on St. Martin and the fact we had such a small class, we had such a small community and it was really, really eye opening to see how much, um, how big of a difference there is and how much disparity there is. So when I was in medical school, we actually did the first healthcare fair um, on the island that we were in, in that area called Colbe. And um, so many people showed up because they just didn't have the same degree of access. And it was very simple things like very uh, preventative things just so we could, you know, uh, address like hypertension, diabetes, things like that. And so many people came in droves. And I think that's when it first occurred to me, like, honestly, these people in rural areas, they deserve like the same degree of like and the same quality of healthcare, which is obviously a no brainer. But I think it's very different when you're actually there and you see the reaction and like the genuine desire that people have and the appreciation that they feel. So that's like what originally started my track, my interest into it. I was also just generally been interested in, in global medicine, um, which, you know, when you're interested in rural medicine, global medicine, there's there's a lot in common with that. So um, my husband's from Zambia. So we, I provided like healthcare supplies to um, this children's home in, um, in, in Livingston, Zambia. So I think all those things that I did during medical school really solidified my desire to go into rural medicine because it's quite frankly the same. You are in a very resource depleted area and you're providing services to people that genuinely need them and they just don't get them because just luck of the draw. They just were born in another place. And I think that's where um, my love for rural medicine came. Yeah, that's an interesting parallel. Yeah. I never thought about you know, living on a small island and serving that community made you really understand the culture of uh, the smaller towns and the healthcare needs. Oh yeah, that. absolutely. And I think the fact that my husband's from a small town and like my in-laws actually still live in Livingston, Zambia, I think you really appreciate the community that the small town has and like how much need there is. And like, I'm originally from India. So even when I was in medical school, I went back to for women's health, um, preventative awareness stuff. And then you see how much disparity there is regarding education for things like um, menstruation and all that kind of women's health stuff. So between women's health stuff and preventative care, um, and then the pediatric aspect, all these things that I did in different countries really solidified my desire for you know pursuing that full time and honing the skills necessary to you know hopefully eventually pursue global medicine and just generally um underserved regions all over yeah and i kind of want to dive a little bit more into this because you've been mentioning bits and pieces uh, what are the unique aspects of practicing medicine in a rural environment as opposed to being in a big city. So I know we talked before you mentioned home visits being one of the like yeah. coolest things that like separates that experience away from being in a big city. Uh, and you touched a lot uh, on a lot of uh, other different aspects kind of in the past couple minutes. So let's really dive into those because I find that really interesting and something that if you're not in that environment, you may never get to experience. No. So that's a great question. So I can definitely speak to this because I lived in 
like actually the city um, in New York City on the in Midtown West. So I and I did a lot. I have a lot of experience in Brooklyn and Queens. So you'd be surprised to see that a lot of places that you consider to be big cities, there's also a huge discrepancy between um, the resource plentiful areas and resource poor areas. So in that regard, being in a rural area, it's not that different from being in a resource poor area um, in a larger city. You still have inner city areas that don't have the same degree of resources. So in terms of the di diversity of patients that you see, they're, they're quite similar. But I would say the difference is the biggest difference is that when you're in a smaller area, you actually develop a very close knit bond with the people that you're around and you actually get to have a truly deeper understanding of what healthcare means. Um, and when I say that, that's of particular importance in rural areas because it's very multifactorial. It's there are components like where you're uh, where you're living, how far you're living. So when you are trying to develop a plan with your patients to deal with um, whatever uh, healthcare condition that they have, you have to keep those in mind. And you're able to do that because you actually can do home visits. And um, so I actually have a couple of patients that I get to do home visits for. And the reason I offer that and the reason that uh, we do that in our clinic is because if you have someone who is chronically ill, they have disabilities, you know, they don't have a lot of, you know, resources. They don't necessarily have cars that are functioning. How are they supposed to get from their home to the clinic to check up on and get their diabetes medication if they can't get out of bed because they're bed bound, you know, things like that. And so we offer that service. And I think that um, being able to do that, you actually truly get a deeper idea and a deeper sense of how people are actually living. And if you understand how people are actually living, then you can truly be you know, I could say this for family medicine, you could truly be a good family medicine doctor, because it's very holistic in that sense, you see what they're actually going through, what their actual conditions are in terms of their living arrangements. And it, I think it's very eye opening, which you don't really, you don't really get to do that in urban areas, just because, you know, for whatever, like, I don't think home visits are as common in urban areas, as they are in rural areas, just because I think there it's a little bit easier to access and could be, you know, everyone obviously has their own difficulties, but compared to a rural area, just the distance traveled is a lot less. Also, um, you get to do a lot more procedures. Um, often being in a rural area, you truly have the opportunity to practice the full scope of family medicine in particular, uh, full scope of medicine, because, um, Quite often, you're, there's not too many specialists that are there, and since you are there, you do take on additional roles, and you do have to be able to be well-versed in those roles and be able to effectively do them. So I think that makes it um, really unique, in my uh, opinion. And I can imagine, because um, we talk about a lot of holistic stuff now in our medical training. Which yeah. I absolutely love. So I remember multiple cases where we would have a conversation at the end about hey, this person had to get flown in um, for an emergency procedure and we need this person to come in for a post-op follow-up, but they're two hours away. Exactly. From the hospital. How do we ensure that they are you know, followed up on? Because that's very important in uh, important, important. <laughs> in their management exactly. and then not just that but i can imagine there's a whole deeper level of trust that needs to be established mm -hmm. i have uh a couple peers some of my close peers i uh, grew up in like thomasville georgia like one of those you throw a dart down the map of south georgia and if it lands furthest away from any other major city, that's where the town is. Um, and like his dad is the only doctor in town. Yeah. So I can imagine putting that much trust into one person has to be really different and very unique to environments like that. It's a huge responsibility. And I think it's a huge 
privilege. And I think that um, that's the best part about the program that, that I'm at is that you are trained um, in a larger academic center um, so that you are able to provide good quality care because there is nothing worse, in my opinion, than um, having all these people trust you and, you know, put their faith in you to help them and like, you know, take care of them. But then you are just way, you know, out of your depth and you're just trying to, um, you know, try to make the most of it. And we've all been in those situations where you're out of your depth, but I think that it's really little I cut that part out. <laughs> okay, what I was going, I just started stumbling. Okay, what I was going to say, oh yeah, I'm supposed to wait two minutes, two seconds. Okay, what I was going to say was there's, in my opinion, I think there's nothing worse than feeling as though you are not capable of carrying the burden or the responsibility of people's trust. And I think that, at least for me, that's the hardest thing. I don't want to disappoint my patients. And you want to make sure that you know your stuff. And I think that it's honestly a huge responsibility and a huge privilege, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, you turn on the news, medical mistrust is rampant mm -hmm. right now. Um, so how are ways that you are able to get people to trust you, especially maybe they don't have access to the news or um, may not be as medically or healthcare literate? So that's actually very common. It's so common. Like healthcare literacy is such a big um, issue because we just, I guess people just haven't um, been exposed to it as much and it can get really confusing really fast. I know like right now when I'm doing my MICU rotation, it's sometimes very difficult to um, explain what is happening because it's so complex and it's difficult because we don't necessarily always get taught that in medical school, how to simplify it to the layman's terms. And I think that's something that you, you know, develop as you go along with experience. And I think that's so important because there's such a discre discrepancy in healthcare literacy. So what I do is that I try to, <sighs> okay. So what I do <laughs> is that I usually typically have my phone with me, obviously. And then when I try to explain something, what I do is I pull up a picture of it on my phone and be like, okay, this is what we're doing. And this is like, this is what it looks like. And I think that once you even just show people that, they just really start to trust you because you actually took the time to listen. So I think I don't really do anything special, but that's what I, I literally do that. I found that it makes a huge difference. Like I tried to, um, yeah, just take my phone and be like, you know what? I know this is scary. Let me just show you what that means. And I try to actually just explain it. And for, and I guess people like that because they seem to be a lot more trusting, but also that means that my clinic visits take a little bit longer. So I'm working on time management. And well, it, it's worth it because at the end of the day, the, the patient yeah. and the patient's family goes home with a better, better understanding. And, you know, one of the situations that, um, <laughs> This is a really funny story. I was told by an OB resident that somebody came in and this was like that patient's first medical visit in I think 15 years. Oh my gosh. And yeah, they were talking about um, women's health stuff and the patient like, hey, I don't, I don't use tampons. And it's like, okay. He goes, yeah, it's because they can get you pregnant. Mm -hmm. And the resident was like, wait, what? Because yeah. yeah, like my mom, my mom told me, my grand, my grandmother told me, never use tampons because it it could get you pregnant, and it was like one of those realizations of okay, there definitely is, you know, generational. Um, I guess I don't want to say old wives' tale because that makes it sound kind of bad, but just like if you've never been taught or instructed better, and nobody took the time to explain it to you, then change can't happen mm -hmm. and i think that's where having you know a art of medicine i, I like to call it when yeah. you're in the room and uh, really taking the time to explain things and ensure patient understanding that could you never know that could change healthcare for that family for literally generations absolutely and i think i picked up on that um during one of my rotations during my surgery rotation as a medical student my attending used to actually like 
draw out in a very simplified fashion but he like in the clinic like you know how you have like the paper he would like mm -hmm. draw out what was gonna happen yep. and that like stuck with me because i'm like you know what this is so smart but i suck at drawing so i just pull up a picture <laughs> on my phone <clears throat> and i'm like look this is what we're doing <laughs> It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be that crazy. Like I remember uh, when I was working in the neurosurgery department here. Like somebody's going in for an aneurysm coiling, and the neurosurgeon took the time to draw it out on like the bed paper. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't fancy. It was literally like two lines, a little bulge, <clears throat> and it was like. So we go in, we take some wire, and like here, here's the aneurysm, mm -hmm. and we just put wire in there so that way, like when blood flows, you just drew an arrow. It doesn't go in that little bulge and she's like oh okay yeah. because if you know they're i'm not saying to the extent of a neurosurgery procedure but even something as simple as like here's your medication or but like, again in this current climate here's the vaccine yeah you know having to kind of extinguish some of those fears help calm them down and get them to a point where they understand how and why this is helpful to them was speaking about the vaccine. So actually like I found a good way to talk about it is like, I would literally just try to like make it parallel to something that's a little bit more understandable. Like you have like, you're these little army soldiers inside your body that, you know, need to see a picture of what they're attacking. And, you know, the vaccine comes in, gives you the, your body, the picture, and then, you know, like just disappears basically in, in very simplified way it doesn't actually disappear but and then they were like oh okay so it's not like they're giving you COVID I'm like no there it's like if you saw like a criminal and then you take a picture of the criminal and then you give it to the police department it's not like you're sending the criminal to the police department yeah so then they kind of like started to understand like Oh, I'm not going to get COVID if I get the vaccine because it's like a picture. It's it's a way for my body to recognize it and prepare accordingly to get the antibodies and you know something like that. <laughs> I'm gonna use that. Wait, that was a that's amazing. I'm gonna use that on rotations. <laughs> yeah, and I, it, yeah, it really makes a difference. And I'm like, you just you're like you're you have a little army inside of you, your body trying to protect you, and you gotta be there for your you got you gotta be there for your body. And the vaccine gives you like a little picture of like the criminals, like oh, do not enter. And they make little like weapons against this criminal. So when the criminal like if the criminal comes, they're like oh, we're ready to go, and they have their little weapons ready. So that's what it is. It's not like the vaccines uh, vaccines giving you COVID. It's that they're preparing your internal army for for that. So it's explaining things in that fashion, I think it's like interesting. It makes it people more engaged and easier to understand. I think that's one of the biggest things is like I can understand like sometimes when you go to the doctor, it can be very intimidating. I think that's my biggest thing is like you want to be relatable and try to like simplify things but not dumbify it. that's my biggest thing it's like you want to simplify things that's a really good yeah really like good you, way of putting it. you want to simplify it so that it's understandable but not dumbify it and give incorrect information because people are truly a lot more smarter than you actually think that they are it's just that they just did not have the same degree of resources and education that we had the privilege to get and i think that when you come from that kind of standpoint your patients see it they understand it and they're more willing to trust you because you're not looking down on them like, oh, why didn't you take the vaccine? Da, da, da. It's because, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why they did it. And there, it, being judgy has no place. Like it's, you know, part of our, I, I believe part of our duty as doctors is also to be educators. And um, that's part, like that's, it kind of comes with the territory, especially in rural medicine. You have to have that sort of um, patience and compassion and understanding. Absolutely. And you know, I've, I've said all the time um, that, you know, medical students, they always get touted as you know, the smartest of the smart. And even within mm -hmm. uh, your med school class, your cohort, like you'll kind of see a spectrum of really book smart and then like really people smart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in fact, you get a lot of imposter syndrome and I'm tossing myself in this group too. It doesn't go away. It happens to all of us. <laughs> I, I know. Um, 
But, you know, you, you see the people that are, like, top of your class as far as scores mm -hmm. and, and test grades. But, you know, all my advisors have told me, you know, typically those aren't the best doctors. And that's, that's no offense, no disrespect to those people because they are literally some of the most brilliant people mm -hmm. I've ever met in the world. But it is an art to merge that people skills over because what good is having all this information if you can't properly communicate it to your patient? Exactly. And that's um, not just it. Like, I think it's very important in family medicine, obviously, but um, I think that goes for any specialty. And I think that people be sleeping on family medicine, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a chance to sell it near the end. Um, actually, you know what? No, screw it. Let's, let's let's do it now. So, um, something cool about MCG, and I mentioned earlier that I'm a guinea pig class. And for those of you watching or listening that have followed my channel for a while, you'll know that um, I'm the guinea pig class of a three plus curriculum uh, at MCG, meaning that you have the possibility of graduating with an MD in three years. And that initiative was started to push out physicians in specifically primary care specialties. So that is pediatrics, uh, family medicine, internal medicine, psychiatry. Um, and then they also throw gen surge and um, EM in there. But they're pushing it out so that you quickly train in Georgia. And then you have to serve a certain amount of years in underserved areas within Georgia, most of them being rural areas. And that's a huge emphasis at our school to address some physician shortages. Now, a lot of places are starting to do that. Uh, either that or begin to have a focus on serving those areas where there may not be as much attention. So why do you think there's such a big emphasis now on building interest in serving those communities in rural areas? I think that there's always been an interest in serving, but I think that with the... Uh, progression in technology and like the growth, especially like the fact that like technology just like skyrocketed um, with the pandemic. I think that the combination of those factors has made it feasible. Um, we're in a unique time in history where like the economics of providing healthcare, the um, interest in providing healthcare is there and like the like the capabilities through technology are also there and they've also just happened to merge at this time in history where we are capable of providing care in a way that we necessarily weren't able to do in the uh, in the past and a lot of that has to do with um the difference is in the way that uh Healthcare is being compensated now after the pandemic with, in terms of telemedicine visits, which is a huge, also a huge component in rural medicine is just the fact that, you know, maybe you can't travel all that way. But now with telemedicine being a feasible HIPAA compliant um, possibility where physicians and uh, other providers are getting compensated for their work, it makes it a more attractive um, option because I'm sure that Rural medicine has always been interesting. It has always been something that people, you know, wanted to do. But just because of the way that the the system was structured with regard to the economics of it and the technology aspect of it, we just weren't where we are right now with it, I think. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, times are changing mm -hmm. uh, throughout my first 18 months of medical school. They actually incorporated telemedicine yeah. into our curriculum um, where uh, we would actually have a, a real patient um, with chronic conditions that we would follow, follow up with in telemedicine visits. And we would be in the EMR giving, uh, writing up notes to send to their primary care physician. And that is something that is new, but at this point, I don't think it's ever going to go away in medicine. Mm -mm. I don't think we can turn back now. Like, and, and I think we wouldn't want to. I think this is so. I actually wrote a paper on telemedicine over um, the pandemic, like 2020. And we were, the paper discusses about how um, the pandemic actually propelled and catapulted telemedicine far more than it had done in the past 10 years. This pandemic really just 
change the game because originally there was a lot of concerns about like HIPAA compliancy and all this um, bureaucratic stuff, which, you know, it comes from a reasonable place, but we weren't really um, pushed to really address it. But then once the pandemic happened, um, it was addressed in a fashion that we really propelled telemedicine to the forefront. And because of that, now you have greater accessibility. And, you know, like I was saying in the past, like, we didn't have the same technology and the Wi-Fi and the internet capacity that we do right now. Um, and as a result of that, like you were very limited. Like, so if I have to travel two hours to see one patient, it's going to be limited. Right. Um, and it's going to be difficult to recruit physicians to come to a place when they don't even get to see as many patients, because perhaps most of the time they're either in their car or they don't have enough patients able to come into the clinic. But now because of telemedicine, you're still able to increase and see the number of you're still able to increase your patient volume and see a large number of patients because you have these facilities and the technology to support you in doing so. And I don't think, and I think this is something that physicians have been pushing for a long time and there's no turning back. Like it's amazing. And the access to specialists too. Like if I want, if I need a consult in the hospital in, in a rural setting, I can, um, you know, FaceTime a specialist back at like, you know, home base, you know, in a larger, um, in a larger university hospital and still provide that same degree of care, which was just not feasible before um, iPads and technology became mainstream the way that they are right now. Yeah. Technology and medicine is fun, isn't it? Yes. It's the greatest. <laughs> Progress. Um, okay. Now I really, I really want you to sell kind of a uh, pros and cons section to Rural family medicine. Um, okay. Because because I haven't specifically done a seventy three question interview with a family medicine doc, this will kind of like hold people out until <laughs> I get the chance to to actually do one. Um, <laughs> so time time to sell your specialty like car salesman. So what what would be the ideal person or personality for rural family medicine? And we'll we'll do it specifically rural. Family. Okay. Yes. It's very specific to rule because it is different. Okay. So mm -hmm. I would say let's start with the cons. Okay. We'll get the bad out of the way. The cons are you're in, a, you're in a small town, right? So you don't have the same degree of access. Like if you're like a foodie and you like to try different types of cuisines, you may not have the same degree of access to that. Your Amazon shipping may not come in two days. You might not get Amazon Prime and that might be an issue for some people. <laughs> like you might have to wait three days instead of your one or two, you know? Um, you, so things like that, you, it just, yeah, I would say mostly those are the biggest cons. You don't necessarily get, um, oh, if you want to travel, you might have to travel a little bit further to get to the nearest airport because you're so inland or, you know, further away. So things like that, like if you like to travel, that makes it a little bit harder. Um, if you like to eat a lot of different cuisines or you don't like to cook, um, you don't have that many options. And if you are a big um, online shopping fan, uh, that might be a little tricky. You might have to be a little bit more patient. So those are the biggest cons. Uh and I would say that those are really the only cons, quite frankly. Um, the pros are the fact that, it's, okay, I will talk about in terms of family medicine. So family medicine at its core is very broad spectrum. It's for people like me who like absolutely everything, okay? We like everything. We like doing everything. We like a little bit of adult. We like a little bit of kids. We like a little bit of like geriatrics. Well, you can't tie us down to one specialty. <laughs> like, so it's for people that like to do everything and see everything. And, you know, just, you, you just have so many different experiences. Am I going to see a baby today? Or am I going to see a geriatric patient? Or am I going to see a pregnant patient? There's a lot of stuff that you could do. And also you could do procedures. So for people like that, family medicine is great. Now, if you're someone that's like, okay, I want to be, highly knowledgeable about one specific thing and see that one specific thing and just have an expert opinion on that, the family medicine is probably not the best thing for you because it's very broad and, you know, it may, that's not for everybody. So 
that's that's like the core of family medicine. You gotta like do it a lot of different stuff and um, find it fun. I find it fun because I don't know what to expect and it's really interesting. And you know, if you want, you have the opportunity to do a lot of procedures in rural family medicine, especially. So for my program, I actually have an entire block um, dedicated to just procedures as part of the curriculum that my program has as part of the rural track that the traditional track does not have. Because in the rural setting, if you're the only doctor in like a hundred miles <laughs> and someone needs a toenail avulsion or a circumcision or something, or, you know, whatever that they may need, you know, chances are if it's an outpatient procedure, you may, if you feel comfortable to do so, would be the one to be doing it. Um, so you get experience in that. And I think that's the best part about being a rural family doctor is because you actually get to do so much stuff and you don't get to do as much, um, relatively speaking, uh, if you're in a, in an area with so many different specialists, because you're just like, well, I could just, you know, um, you know, send my patient to someone who does this, like, you know, for 12 hours a day, like, they probably want to go there too. So it's fine, you know. So I think that you get to do a lot more, a lot, lot more in rural family medicine. Obviously, with that comes a responsibility to do those things well, because you don't want to, you know, disappoint your patients and, um, you know, make, make sure that you do a good job. So I would say those are like the biggest pros. I think the type of personality you have to be, you have to be the type of person that doesn't, you know, the type of person that's flexible and a little bit more easygoing, I would say, because, you know, things can come up and you have to just be able to roll with the punches and be a little bit more creative um, and make the best of what you have in front of you. So if you're the type of person that like the uncertainty or um, the ability to think on your feet is not really something that you want to do or can do in your daily day-to-day -day practice, then maybe it's not necessarily the best for you. Um, so I would say those are the personal. And also you have to be patient. You have to be patient because you're dealing with um, generational issues with healthcare because, you know, there's been a lot of, um, how do I say this? You have to be patient because you, a part of being the face of healthcare in rural family medicine is that you may be dealing with some generational mistrust in healthcare and you have to have the patience and the rapport and the compassion to deal with those issues head on so that people do trust you because deep down they really do want to trust you. It's just that they have been burned in the past and you have to be cognizant of that. And if that's something that you don't have patience with, then probably rural family medicine is not right for you. That is a very, very good point. Yeah. Um, something that's, um, I think, a key consideration for family medicine and um, something that is very much reflected in some of my peers that are interested in family medicine or primary care right now. So uh, I, I would, to anybody watching or listening, that I would take that advice too hard yeah um, sorry one other point that i would like to say is that the other thing that's very important to um keep in mind and a, a characteristic that i think is really important is that you have to be able to invest in the community that you're um being a part of because you're part of that community and the thing is like you're not coming into as an outsider into a smaller community and judging them in the way that they live life you have to just be there and understand how they do things and, you know, empower people to embrace their strength. You're not there to fix something. You're there to provide the best service that you can provide and uplift everyone around you. So, you know, it's important not to come from that like superiority judgment that maybe some people may have that, oh, I'm going to go into a rural area and I'm going to show them and fix this. Da, da, da. No, no one asked you to do that. <laughs> like, they're they're great you know the people are amazing and they just had different experiences than maybe you did and i think it's important to come from that degree of understanding and just uplift the people around you because everyone has so much to offer 
Okay. Uh, even more credible advice. Uh, <laughs> clip that. Wow. <laughs> uh, people, people really need to hear that. Seriously, because I think that is, um, I think at its core, medicine. Ser- serving people mm-hmm. where they're at and meeting them um, there. That's just, oh, it makes me happy. Oh, yay. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. And now we're going to get into some reflective ones as we round things out. Okay. First one, what is one advice you would give yourself a year ago? What <laughs> an advice, some advice I would give myself a year ago is just let it go. <laughs> I just feel like let go of your expectations, let go of other people's expectations for you. Just do what makes you happy. And I think that if you just do what makes you happy without trying to fit into people's neat little boxes, you'll find that you'll have a lot of different experiences that will eventually make you grow into um, a more interesting person. And I think that's what I would tell myself because you know, it's so easy when you're a medical student to get caught up in um, what your peers are doing and like, oh, how many papers did this person publish? And, oh, what rotations did they get? How do they do on their step one score? Um, or, you know, when we had back in my day, we step one was scored. So <laughs> like, how do they do on their step one? How do they do on step two? You know, there's it's very easy to get sucked into that competitiveness. And um, now I'm happy to see that medical students have a more like appreciation for mental health and things like that. But, um, that was not the case as much, um, when like I was going through it. And I think that's what I would tell myself is just let it go, take it easy. Things will work themselves out the way that they're meant to. And, you know, just enjoy the ride, even though it's really hard to do that when, you know, perhaps you're going through a difficult time. Yeah. And I mean, we're trying to change things for the better. Yeah, I so see that. Progress, mm-hmm. progress is made. Uh, now, next question. What is one thing you would say to your future self? One advice you would give? I would say, I would tell my future self, do not forget your struggles. Do not forget your failures. And do not forget all the times you were down. Because I think it's really important to remember where you came from. And that is, and no matter where you end up, you can't forget the times when you were down. And I think it's important to remember that because the people that you encountered, they may be going through something similar in their life and you just don't know where other people are in their life. And I think it just keeps you um, grateful and also keeps you, um, maintains that compassion, I think. Very good advice. Now, last question. There's a lot of pre-meds and med students, aspiring medical students and physicians uh, tuning in. So what is the one advice you would give to the prospective medical student watching or listening now? You're smarter than you think. <laughs> I'll definitely tell you that. You're a lot smarter than you think. And if you are going through that imposter syndrome, let me tell you, we all are. We're all just trying to figure it out. And, you know, I think I tell my medical students that, uh, you know, you guys know a lot more than you think you do. You know, all those pathways and stuff that we did in biochemistry, we don't remember that. Like, uh, you know, you you know a lot more than you think and have confidence in that and just do the best that you can. And don't be too hard on yourself because you definitely know a lot more than you think you do. And if you don't, You know, don't judge yourself for not being where you want to be. Just figure out what your weaknesses are. Accept those. Not judge them. Accept that. And try to figure out an actionable plan to grow. Wow. Okay. (laughs) Uh, That was was amazing. Honestly, because that's advice I need to uh, incorporate into my own life. We were all there. Um, We were all there. That's what I mean. That's what I want to tell my future self don't forget that like i i've been there you know like you i've ever i've had those times where i was like i don't know anything but you know in retrospect and you see it now like where when you're on the other side you're like you know what you guys do know a lot like you're gonna get in your own way just let it go like and just do the best that you can and if 
we all have weaknesses and the key thing is not to judge yourself for having weaknesses or I wouldn't even say weaknesses, areas of improvement. <laughs> Let's call them areas of improvement. We all have areas of improvement. Accept that you have that, acknowledge it, and deal with it face forward without judgment because judgment's not going to be like help you get that 280 or whatever, like <laughs> that step two. Just focus on what you need to focus on and deal with it. Well, thank you so much. Dr. Shaw, uh, for spending that time to be on the show. Uh, for those uh, who want to find you, where can people find you on social media? Okay, you. <laughs> so I do also have a YouTube channel, a budding YouTuber. Um, so you can just type in Zeoshot MD, and um, you can also find me on Instagram, Twitter. I don't use Twitter that much, and Facebook also Zeoshot MD. So. You could just, uh, I use Instagram the most. I make a lot of reels on day in the life of an intern so you can see what it's actually like in real time of being a rural family medicine intern. And yeah, so it's Yosha MD. Super easy, super easy to remember. All that will hopefully be linked in the description of the video and the podcast episodes on streaming platforms. So thank you so much uh it was a joy talking with you and i know you're inspiring a ton of medicine oh medical thank students you and future rural medicine uh doctors out there yeah for all you people who like pineapple on your pizza i still love you Thank you so much for watching or listening to the Beyond the Scope podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's guests and to make sure that you don't miss a single episode, make sure that you follow Beyond the Scope on all streaming platforms, as well as if you want to see the full video cut, subscribe to my YouTube channel, NDMD. As always, subscribe, like, follow, comment, all that good stuff, and we'll see you in the next one.